Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here, and uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, Chairman Johnson joined us, too. He just said he's got, like, three different hearings going on at once this morning, like all of us. Um, but I appreciate him being here. I know some other members of the panel are, are going to join us later. Um, I want to begin, though, by thanking Claire McCaskill. This is Senator McCaskill on my first hearing together as a chair and ranking member of the Permanent Subcommittee. Uh, I'm glad to have a chance to team up with her again. We actually chaired and co-chaired a subcommittee on oversight uh, in the last Congress. I was in that chair. She was in this chair. Uh, but we worked very well together. And uh, as some of you know, she's a former state auditor and a prosecutor all in one. So she was very effective at the oversight. And um, we'll see that again today and going forward with so many of our projects. Uh, she likes to root out waste and fraud and abuse particularly. and uh, so. I thank her for working so closely with us on this and, and other investigations. This is a unique uh, organization, the subcommittee. Um, PSI has uh, investigative powers that allow us to do deeper dives in conducting uh, our oversight of the federal bureaucracy. Um, we also want to use this subcommittee uh, to build the foundation for policy, and that's really what we're doing today. And um, then finally, we're going to be rooting out some private wrongdoing uh, that warrants a public response. Together, uh, Senator McCaskill and I have a number of very interesting long-term projects underway at PSI today that would fit in each one of these three categories. Uh, this morning, we're going to focus on an important policy issue, as I say, and that's, frankly, how the U.S. tax code affects the market for corporate control. Uh, this topic involves the jargon of corporate finance, as we'll hear today. But what it really involves is jobs and investment. And um, it's negatively impacting our economy today because our tax code's not working. Uh, we see the headlines every week, practically, about the loss of some American corporate headquarters. More often than not, it's to a country that has a more competitive corporate tax rate. That's easy to find when you have the highest rate among all the developed countries, uh, but also countries that have a different international system, a territorial system of taxation. Our tax code, frankly, just makes it hard to be an American company, and it puts U.S. workers at a disadvantage. At a 39 percent combined state and federal rate, the United States does have this highest rate among the industrial world. Uh, adding insult uh, to injury, our government taxes American businesses for the privileges of taking their overseas profits and reinvesting them here at home, which is something we should be encouraging, not discouraging. Uh, economists will tell us that this burden of our tax um, on the corporate side falls primarily on workers uh, in the form of lower wages, fewer job opportunities. And again, that's really what's at stake here. Uh, all of our competitors have cut their corporate taxes and eliminated repatriation taxes, including uh, our neighbor to the north. Um, just about all of them have. Uh, we haven't touched our corporate tax code rate really since the 1980s. Uh, we haven't changed international code in any significant way since the 1960s. In the meantime, every one of our competitors have. As a result, uh, too many American businesses are headed for the exit, and um, this is at a loss of thousands of American jobs. The unfortunate reality is that U.S. businesses are often more valuable in the hands of foreign acquirers who can reduce their tax bills. By the way, it's one reason that you see this big increase in foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies. Last year, we now know that the number of uh, foreign takeovers increased. In fact, last year it doubled to $275 billion from the year before. So doubling in terms of the value of foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies last year from the previous year. This year we are on track to surpass $400 billion, so going from 275 to $400 billion, according to DealLogic. Uh, again, far outpacing the increase in overall global mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, the numbers are there. It should be very clear that foreign investment in the United States is essential to economic growth. We want more of it. We want foreign investment here. That's not the issue. Uh, but we want a tax code that doesn't distort ownership decisions by handicapping U.S. businesses. That's not good for our U.S. economy. And that's what we have today. What's happening is that the current tax system increasingly drives U.S. businesses into the hands of those best able to reduce their tax liabilities, not necessarily those best equipped to create jobs and increase wages here at home. That's, of course, bad for American workers and bad for our long-term competitiveness as a country. 
To better understand the trend and inform legislative debate over tax reform, this subcommittee has decided to take a hard look at this issue. Over the past several months, the subcommittee has reviewed more than a dozen recent major foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies and mergers in which U.S. firms relocated overseas. Again, this was a bipartisan project. Senator McCaskill's experienced team at PSI worked with us every step of the way. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Today's hearing is a culmination of that hard work. We heard directly both from U.S. companies that have felt the tax-driven pressures to move offshore and from foreign corporations whose tax advantages have turbo turbocharged their growth by acquisition. Uh, one such foreign company is Quebec-based Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Over the past four years, as we'll talk about, Valiant has managed to acquire a slew of U.S. companies worth more than $30 billion. The subcommittee reviewed key deal documents to understand how tax advantages affected Valiant's three largest acquisitions to date, including the 2013 sale of New York-based eye care firm Bausch & Lomb, 2015 sale of North Carolina-based drug make, uh, maker Salix. Um, we learned that in those two transactions alone, Valiant determined it could shave more than $3 billion off the target company's tax bills by integrating them into the Canadian-based corporate group. Those tax savings meant that Valiant's investments in its American targets would have higher returns and pay for themselves more quickly, two key drivers, of course, of, of any acquisition. All three Valiant acquisitions we studied, unfortunately, came with job loss in the United States. Beyond inbound acquisitions, America is also losing corporate headquarters through mergers in which U.S. companies relocate overseas. Uh, the latest news, frankly, is the U.S. agricultural business Monsanto's proposed $45 million merger with its European counterpart, Syngenta. A key part of that proposed deal, as we understand it, is a new global headquarters, not in the U.S., but in London. To better understand this trend, the subcommittee chose to review in detail the 2014 merger, 2014 merger of Burger King with Canadian coffee and donut chain Tim Hortons, $11.4 billion agreement that sent Burger King's corporate headquarters north of the border. Our review showed that Burger King had strong business reasons to team up with Tim Hortons. But the record also shows that when deciding where to locate the headquarters of the combined firm, tax considerations ruled out the United States. At the time, Burger King estimated that pulling Tim Hortons into the worldwide tax net, U.S. tax net, rather than relocating to Canada, would destroy up to $5.5 billion in value over just five years. $5.5 billion in an $11 billion deal. Think about that. That's a lot. The company concluded it was necessary to put the headquarters in a country that would allow it to reinvest overseas earnings back in the U.S., and Canada without an additional tax hit. They ultimately chose, of course, Tim Horton's home base of Canada. Both Valiant and Burger King played by the rules. I think that's an important point to be made. They and their deal partners responded to economic pressures, opportunities, and incentives created by our tax laws. If there's a villain in this story, it's the U.S. tax code. And frankly, it's Washington, not doing what Washington should be doing to reform it. My goal is to use these examples this morning and others we'll hear about today to better understand the need to overhaul our broken corporate tax code and put U.S. businesses and workers on a level playing field. Again, thank the witnesses for being here, and I'd like to hear now from Senator McCaskill for her opening statement.